Welcome everyone to our End Rape Campaign Expert Interview Series. I'm Dr. Caroline Helpen, the Executive Director of the Representation Project, and this is our therapy kit in Baldwin. Uh, I just want to make sure that I mention a trigger or activation warning today. We will be discussing sexual violence. Uh, this is a series uh, where we interview the top experts in their respective fields on how to end sexual violence, uh, how to address it in a way that is humane and just. Um, and I am so honored to interview Professor Michelle Dauber today. Uh, let me read your bio. It is, uh, you, you've had a decorated career so far and as a law professor and a sociologist, uh, Michelle Landis Dauber has written highly original historical and sociological studies, focusing on the history of social provision in the US welfare state. Her first book, The Sympathetic State, received numerous distinguished book awards and prizes, including those from the American Historical Association, the American Sociological Association, the American Political Science Association, the American uh, Society for Legal History and the Law and Society Association, which is remarkable because that is across so many fields that speaks to the contribution that her work has made. Uh, Professor Dauber has received numerous grants for her research, including from the National Endowment for the Humanities. She is also the recipient of the 2006 Walter J. Gores Award, Stanford University's highest teaching honor. And prior to joining the Stanford faculty in 2001, Professor Dauber was a clerk to Judge Stephen Reinhardt of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth District, uh, where she served from 1998 to 1999, and a doctoral fellow at the American Bar Foundation from 1999 to 2001. Um, from 2011 to 2013, Professor Dauber co-chaired the Board on Judicial Affairs and helped to lead the process that revised Stanford's policy on sexual assault. She is a nationally known and respected advocate for improving college and university policies on sexual assault in order to increase compliance with Title IX. Uh, despite the documented success of these reforms, in 2014, a backlash resulted in rolling back many of these reforms that brought Dauber into uh, a highly public conflict with her institution, which she has repeatedly called one of the most unfriendly schools for survivors in the country based on its well-documented, highly regressive policies and procedures. From two, uh, 2016 to 2018, Professor Dauber led the successful recall campaign against Aaron Persky, the judge who sentenced Stanford rapist Brock Turner to just probation and a few months in jail after a jury convicted Turner, a recruited athlete of three felony sex crimes for sexually assaulting an unconscious woman behind a dumpster at a Stanford frat party. Uh, following the successful recall campaign, Dauber founded a, a political action committee, Enough is Enough Voter Project, that led the successful repeal of California's spousal rape exception, which has been a longstanding goal of the feminist and domestic violence community for over 50 years. So welcome, Professor uh, Michelle Dauber. It is just an honor to be speaking with you today. Thank you for having me. Well, let's jump right in here. Uh, and don't worry, folks, uh, you will be able to ask your own questions. Just pop, pop them into the Q&A at any point and we will get to them at the end of our interview. Um, so Professor Dobbert, tell us about your life plan uh, working on sexual violence. When did you take up this work and why? And of course, the term sexual violence here includes sexual and gender-based violence and harassment. Uh, thank you again, and it's an honor to be here. Um, so I've been interested in this subject since I was an undergraduate student, actually, um, and uh, received a research grant to study the treatment of victims of intimate partner violence um, in the juvenile courts. Um, and I was also involved in a lot of racial justice and feminist activism um, on campus, both as an undergraduate and as a law student. Um, so when I arrived at Stanford, I had a reputation as um, a feminist and progressive professor, and I was relatively young. Um, and I almost immediately started hearing from students. Um, sometimes these were not even my students. Um, they were referred to me um, by others um, about sexual harassment and assault on campus. Um, so survivors would come to me and I would refer them to whoever it was at that time was handling the issue. Um, and because I was at that time kind of a true believer in Stanford, 
um, being a great place and a great institution, um, I would believe that they would be taken care of. Um, and so I was very surprised because these survivors would typically come right back um, like boomerangs uh, and they would be very angry at me. And they would say that they were upset that I had sent them there, um, that the experience was horrible, that no one believed them, that they were interrogated, that nothing happened to the rapist um, or harasser, that they couldn't get counseling services. Um, the counselors that they saw were not trauma informed if they were able to see one. Um, sometimes uh, they would even ask, you know, what they were wearing and why they were wearing a tank top. I mean, it was really regressive. Um, and I started to make referrals then to friends um, who were uh, lawyers, um, because remember, I was a law professor. Um, and so I would find pro bono lawyers for survivors. And then my friends, these pro bono lawyers would start coming back to me and laying out for me how terrible the situation at Stanford really was. And that was very eye opening for me. And I thought that um, I could help to repair the situation. And I joined several different committees and advisory boards and spent thousands of hours rewriting uh, policies and procedures to try to make Stanford less hostile to survivors. I presented uh, to faculty committees and administrators. I collected data that proved you know, the empirical basis of all my proposals. And the research that I did showed that um, during the 13 year period from 1996 to 2009, which was um, you know, the only years for which there were even data, um, there were only four hearings and two findings of responsibility uh, for sexual violence on campus during that entire uh, 13 year period. And when you asked survivors why they weren't reporting or using Stanford's procedure, they identified three features as problematic. Um, Stanford at that time was one of the very few schools that used the beyond a reasonable doubt standard uh, uh, for the burden of proof. They used direct cross-examination by the alleged perpetrator of the accusing student, and they used a, a large sort of pseudo court setup and that involved a lot of people and was highly public. Um, so survivors would take one look at that and they would say, no, thanks. I you know, don't want to do that quite reasonably. And due to the reforms that I led, um, these three features were eliminated. And without going into more detail, usage of the reporting process at Stanford then shot up dramatically. So we had a tenfold increase um, in utilization in the first three years of the new procedures, which was, you know, by any measure, a stunning success. And this meant that a lot of students uh, were now being found responsible for sexual assault. But the university was not expelling these students or really taking um, much action to sanction them at all. Um, and this occurred in 2014, just as the National Campus Survivor Movement, um, in which Dr. Heldman was involved, um, was launching. And um, at that point, survivors uh, started reaching out to me to tell me that these supposedly great procedures that I wrote um, were terrible and not working because their rapists were not being held accountable. They weren't being expelled even for extremely serious offenses like sexual assault, um, sexual penetration through force. And so I looked at the sanctioning data and sure enough, it was true. And in fact, I found that Stanford had only ever expelled one student. And I think now we might be up to two um, students in its entire 150 year history. Uh, for sexual assault. And at that point, I spoke out somewhat mildly, actually, to the press in support of the students. And from that point on, I was basically blackballed from having any role in anything to do with this subject at Stanford. And the retaliation was extremely swift, extremely personal, and extremely public. Um, and at Stanford, the one thing you cannot do as a faculty member, and I'm a member of the, you know, academic council, faculty, full professor with a named chair. And the one thing you can't do is uh, criticize the university and the press. Um, whatever Stanford says about free speech, whatever they say about academic freedom, in my experience, it does not apply to public criticism of the university itself by the faculty. So I was unable to prevent the backlash um, against these policies when it came because I had been removed from any role. And many of the changes we had made were rolled back and Stanford's procedures at that point became 
um, probably the most unfriendly to survivors uh, in the country. And um, from that point on, I really gave up on the ability of institutions like educational and legal institutions to reform themselves. And I got very interested in the use of democracy to hold these institutions accountable and force reforms on them from the outside um, rather than from the inside. I, that trajectory is feels so familiar to me, the kind of losing, losing your religion when it comes to the institutions being able to take the action they need to take. Uh, let's, let's dive down one layer deeper and talk about what the research tells us are the root causes of sexual violence before we return to your incredible advocacy. Sure, of course. Um, and in my opinion, at the most basic level, the cause and the result of sexual violence and harassment um, is a deep power disparity, which has been sexualized. And there are a lot of aspects to that, a lot of ways in which sexualization of violence is normalized in our society through pornography and the objectification of women um, that's created through prostitution. Um, but the cause and the effect of, of this is inequality, specifically women's inequality, but also forms other forms of inequality that are overlapping, including race, um, financial status, immigration status, ethnicity, um, disability, and so on. And um, this is really uh, Catherine McKinnon's central point, um, the legal scholar Catherine McKinnon, and I have I, I see nothing that has ever come close to disputing or disproving it. And in fact, I think the rise of the ubiquity of internet pornography has really only strengthened her sort of deepest theoretical points about power. And um, as she has pointed out for decades and more forcefully recently, inequality undermines the reality if not the legality of what we um, tend to call consent. So consent under conditions of deep inequality always has the ring of uh, coercion and that is you know, unavoidable. So people say yes when they think that uh, saying no means that they'll be fired or harmed or even killed or their children will be taken away from them or they won't have a place to live or food or diapers. Um, so it, it's really, you know, a very important question to ask, you know, what value does saying yes have under those conditions? Uh, always the issue is inequality. Always the issue is power. Who has it and who doesn't and why? Can I do a, ask a follow-up question about the sexualization of violence and the link between what we're seeing in media and pornography and video games and uh, how that's connected to violence in the real world? Um, well, there has been a, quite a bit of empirical research, some of which was done by uh, somebody I'm going to talk about a little bit later, Charlene Sen, who is a professor in Canada. Um, but there is quite a bit of research showing that um, exposure, for example, to um, these kinds of media images, and I think, you know, the film that, you know, is connected to this project, Misrepresentation, I believe, um, you know, really also helped to underscore the point that these repeated depictions of uh, women being uh, and individuals being depicted, um, being uh, treated violently, but enjoying it um, is, uh, you know, for obvious reasons, harmful. You know, we're coming out with a report on rape myths and media and how this is, you know, how this is amplified through media. And we find exactly that, right? The idea, whether it's pornography or it's the most popular classic movies, available, uh, still still popular. Um, yeah, women are the primary targets of sexual violence and are, chose to, are shown as either being neutral or, or enjoying it. And it also, gets- I would just say Disney movies. I mean, this starts very young. Uh, Beauty and the Beast being, I think, one of the best examples uh, of this, um, you know, sort of uh, intimate partner violence in which, um, uh, somehow she falls in love with her abuser and fixes him. Um, and so, you know, these messages start, you know, very early and very young, and um, they depict 
um, like I said, the sexualization of power um, as appealing and attractive and abuse as something to be enjoyed. And I think that's, you know, uh, you know, you can see it in advertisements for luxury brands and Vanity Fair, and you can see it in pornography the most, you know, obviously. Along those lines, what are some things you wish people just knew about sexual violence and what are some of the, the rape myths or myths of sexual violence you would like to bust? So I think some of the most pernicious myths in this area have to do with intimate partner abuse um, as the appalling public treatment of Amber Heard um, in the Johnny Depp lawsuit against her really showed. So first of all, sexual violence and intimate partner violence are not two different buckets as people imagine them. Domestic abuse um, very, very often includes sexual violence. And referring back um, you know, to the last question, uh, a violent intimate relationship is one in which truly voluntary sex um, is a very difficult, if not you know, impossible you know, situation given the threat of violence that hangs over every single interaction. So what good is the notion of you know, consent? in that kind of a context. Um, spousal rape, intimate partner rape, I mean, these are very underreported crimes in part because the victims face the, you know, sort of why did you stay uh, if it was so bad type uh, victim blaming. Um, and so I think intimate partner violence is, is an area where there's quite a bit of um, myth. Another one is the role um, of alcohol in rape and particularly in campus rape. Um, alcohol does not cause anyone to be a rapist. Alcohol is simply a tool in the hands of a rapist and it makes resistance difficult and it makes memory unreliable. So it is in fact a very good tool, uh, a very you know uh, excellent tool in the hands of a rapist. Um, and it is hard work essentially to use force, whereas, uh, and it leaves marks. Whereas a drunk or unconscious victim, uh, such as Brock Turner's victim, does not have to be subdued with force. And, um, and then, as I said, they may not have a complete memory of events, um, or at least that can be called into question by a defense attorney or a college Title IX investigator. So rapists use alcohol to facilitate raping. Non-rapists are not turned into rapists by alcohol. And the false belief in this idea is incredibly persistent and pernicious. And it has led a lot of colleges to adopt alcohol restrictions um, rather than to hold rapists accountable um, and expel them. And these restrictions do not work. They are counterproductive. Um, they do not reduce alcohol consumption, and uh, but they do drive it underground, which is very dangerous in a number of ways, including more rape. Well, you brought up the Brock Turner case, right? Um, let's let's dive more deeply into that. Tell us about your advocacy work with Chanel Miller and her case against rapist, convicted rapist Brock Turner. Uh, what role did you play in raising awareness about the case and in the eventual removal of Judge Aaron Persky? Um, yeah, thank you for that question. So um, I was the chair of the committee to recall Judge Persky, and this campaign was led and funded by a large and um, uh, racially and uh, otherwise diverse uh, group of women, um, queer women, uh, women of color, and um, uh, other uh, groups of women here in Silicon Valley who wanted to remove Judge Persky for what we believed was um, his history of demonstrated bias in favor of privileged perpetrators of sex crimes um, and violence against women, including most famously the Brock Turner case, but also in several other cases involving college athletes. Um, the campaign took two years and ultimately was successful, winning 62% of the vote in California's second most populous county, um, Santa Clara County, where San Jose is located. Um, so as I said earlier, I had started around this time, that is 2015, 2016, to think about ways to use the political system 
to address the failures of the legal and educational systems to address sexual violence. And this recall was part of that broader political strategy that is to get a hold of the political system and utilize it to hold elected officials accountable for their handling of sexual violence and thereby send a message that sexual and gender-based violence is serious and has to be treated that way or there will be accountability from women voters. Mm. And as I recall, the campaign generated a lot of backlash. Uh, can you tell us about that backlash, where it came from, what was driving it? Yeah, so the vast majority of backlash came from the legal profession, um, of which I'm a member. Um, they uh, simply did not like the idea that a fellow member of the profession, um, that is Aaron Persky, was going to be held to account. And so the Bar Association, the Judges Association, um, the Criminal Defense Bar, which of course had its own obvious perspective um, on this, um, I think the legal um, in the legal profession generally, there was a real missed opportunity here because when Ch Chanel Miller's victim impact statement, she was the uh, she's identified herself as the victim of Brock Turner. She was at that time known as Emily Doe and was anonymous. Um, when her impact statement was released and went viral to the, you know, ridiculously uh, lenient sentence, of Mr. Turner, the profession should have seen that as a moment to introspect. What does it mean that so many women are so angry at us, the legal profession? Um, now remember, this is a full year before the 2017 resurgence of the uh, Me Too movement. Um, so in many ways, the um, the Brock Turner case became, I think, a harbinger of what was coming. Um, but had not yet happened. And there was a seismic shift that was starting to occur and could have been read from 10 million people downloading and reading Chanel's victim impact statement. Um, and instead of looking at that and at the fact that thousands of women, including many women lawyers, were lining up um, against Persky and saying, Instead of looking at that and saying, okay, well, maybe there's a lesson here for us, um, they lash out at me, at the other victims, at Chanel Miller, and there were just really, you know, vicious attacks. And um, this, of course, uh, this victim blaming really only increased support for the recall, and uh, that was borne out by our polling. Um, there was so much victim blaming, just direct, horrible victim blaming by Persky's campaign leaders uh, of Miller. There was so much that we actually held a demonstration in front of the office of his uh, lawyer who was saying these things as his campaign you know, sort of spokesperson. And remember, this was Persky's lawyer, so he is officially his agent and speaking for Persky, and it is reasonable to reflect back those comments upon Aaron Persky himself, who never disavowed them, even though we demanded that he do so. And some of these comments were like, you know, quote, she was not attacked uh, because Turner did not jump out of the bushes, or she was dead drunk. And so that um, mitigated uh, his... Um, culpability. Or um, uh, one former federal judge uh, said on Facebook that it was only his finger, not his penis, as if that was, you know, the issue. Um, another leader of his campaign said that, she, you know, repeatedly that she had consented, even though a jury had already found, as a matter of fact, that she did not consent and she was completely unconscious. So um, these things were all, you know, sort of uh, disseminated through the press. And uh, every time that happened, our polling numbers went up because of the outrage that these inappropriate statements made. And, you know, I'm sure, um, I think that these comments ran up our margin uh, five to seven points. Like, I think we were going to win anyway, but it became a blowout because of these incredibly inappropriate statements that his campaign made. Um, they just confirmed, in my mind, that we were right, and there was, in fact, a serious problem with, first of all, how Persky in specific, but also how many, many lawyers in general, the legal system as a whole, uh, treated sexual violence.
I know it's fascinating to sit in a courtroom and just be you know appalled by things that are said by judges things especially said by defense attorneys that I think if the public were privy to that they they would be horrified to see that it's not really about the truth it's really about besmirching you know the the survivors during the trial and going after them with rape myths and they know that they're working with a jury that is steeped in rape myths so what what a moment right where that only happens with that sort of impunity when folks aren't held accountable um and i you're you know just the, looking at the ripple effects of that in terms of the legal community being put on on watch um but how did you feel when you were attacked by the legal profession of which you are a member yeah. So in the beginning, I was kind of confused by it because it was deeply personal towards me. And I'm going to just say this, even though it makes me sound terribly naive, because I think I was, in fact, terribly naive at the beginning of the campaign. And I think it's important for activists or potential activists in the audience to hear that, you know, there was a learning curve. Um, and I had expected it to be more civil, you know, like, uh, you know, quote, like, we respectfully disagree with Professor Dauber, but it was not like that. It was deeply personal. It involved attacks on me, on my competence, on my, uh, you know, deservingness of, you know, even being a professor, uh, attacks on my family. Um, I received, you know, uh, countless death threats, including two stalker perpetrators who were actually uh, convicted and sentenced, um, uh, to, you know, to jail, um, you know, for the stalking and harassment that I experienced. I got a, an envelope full of white powder, um, and that person was, uh, you know, investigated, prosecuted um, federally. And um, Judge Persky's campaign falsely in, uh, stated that I had staged it for, you know, in order to generate sympathy for the campaign. And, you know, this was like, you know, I was getting like serious um, death threats. And I feel that they were actually had so lost perspective that they were willing to put my life at risk um, by making statements like that when there was still a, a dangerous person on the loose, essentially, who had not yet been caught. Um, and in retrospect, I just want to say that I think it was very naive of me not to have anticipated both the personal nature and the intensity of the backlash, because there is no way that women can challenge so many powerful institutions, judges, lawyers, uh, Stanford University, who's you know, probably the most powerful educational institution in the world, depending on how you measure it, um, without expecting, you know, very serious backlash, um, even including death threats, even including threats to my career and reputation and so forth. So over time, you know, so a two-year campaign, it was a two-year uh, high-profile um, political campaign. And over time, I just came to see it as a sign that we were winning because, you know, the fact is there's never a backlash against you if you aren't a threat. Um, so over time, I learned to just ignore it and move forward um, and see it as a sign of, you know, impending victory. Um, and but I do want to say that at some point, um, Persky's campaign just lost all perspective. And it was very difficult because it included some of my Stanford colleagues uh, who I think just behaved horribly, my, some of my colleagues. Um, and of course, they were some of the same people who had opposed the Title IX reforms at Stanford, um, people who associated with the criminal defense bar. Um, and, you know, it really shouldn't have been surprising to me in retrospect, but I did expect it to be much more civilized and much more, um, you know, I respectfully disagree with Professor Dauber, not Professor Dauber is a horrible liar and deserves all the death threats that she, you know, is getting. Well, and the stakes are so high, right? Because as, as you're measuring that, a backlash means that you're shifting power. Um, what do you think the backlash exposed about the legal profession's failures for women and survivors? Yeah, well, there's a real myopia by legal actors about the way that the legal system from sort of the top to the bottom handles um, sexual and uh, intimate partner violence. And there's a real sense that, you know, they are the only ones, that is lawyers, are the only ones who can judge the efficacy of legal systems and uh, the rest of us are just too dumb to do it. Um, and survivors are not entitled 
to uh, do more than just complain about it um, at best, you know, um, that voters aren't smart enough or legally knowledgeable enough to really weigh in. And there was, you know, sort of both a deep arrogance and a deep misogyny underlying that. And I have to say, that's probably why the attacks became so personal against me, despite all the credentials that you read off at the beginning of this, that a lot of the attacks, you know, really focused on um, you know, my competence, because otherwise, you know, if, if their claim was going to be, you know, non-lawyers or non, you know, legal experts can't judge this, what were they going to do about me? Um, you know, a law professor at, you know, one of the top schools in the um, world with lots of credentials. So, you know, I presented a big problem and undermining me became their, you know, sort of strategy, which is dumb strategy, but that's what they did. Um, but the fact is, um, the California Constitution gives the voters the power to step in um, in very extreme circumstances like the Brock Turner case and um, exercise that, that power of oversight. And I think that sent a very important message that has reverberated and will continue to echo about women's power. It shocked them. And frankly, that is very good. Um, uh, the system in general is set up for women to sort of whine and complain and, you know, oh, that's awful, but, you know, maybe not actually grab the levers of power. And there, it was sort of expected that there would be some like angry op-eds, you know, but not a trip to the voting booth. Mm -hmm. And uh, in which women would get to reject Aaron Persky um, on the grounds of his incompetence to judge uh, cases that involve us. And when women are effective, that is when the system gets angry. Um, so as long as we're ineffective, uh, there's really not much to worry about for them. And in fact, they're happy to, you know, fake pose as allies uh, of women. Um, so one really hilarious example of this came from Erwin Chemerensky, who mm -hmm. was then the dean um, at uh, Irvine yeah. And Irwin had written an op-ed in the Orange County Register after Turner's sentence saying that it was an abuse of discretion. Those are his exact words. It's a quote, abuse of discretion. Um, and uh, when later we quoted that back and said, look, even Irwin Chimarensky thinks this was an abuse of discretion, um, he was just outraged. Um, and he, you know, his, I, his, it was as if he was saying, yeah, I, 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 but I didn't expect you to actually do anything. I thought it was all talk. And when I thought it was all just talky talk, I was happy to pose as an ally of victims. But now that you're doing something, I have a problem with you quoting me. You know, women are allowed to be sad. We're allowed to cry. We're allowed to, uh, you know, you know, sort of moan about the ways in which we're oppressed, but we're not allowed to actually resist that oppression um, in an effective manner. We aren't allowed to take power away from men. And that was shocking. It was like a dog, you know, stood up on its hind legs and started talking. And um, the recall was a wake up call to people who ignore women voters at their peril. And, you know, let me tell you, we're going to see a lot more of that around abortion rights. Um, so I think being effective is, you know, the thing they fear the most. Uh -huh. Well, speaking of effectiveness, I'm going to last, ask my last question before we jump into some what are already great questions I'm seeing in the Q&A from the audience. Um, Professor Dobber, what reforms do you think are the most important to seriously reduce or eliminate sexual violence both on campus and in society more broadly? So I think there are three critical interventions, um, transparency, accountability, and evidence-based prevention. Um, so in terms of transparency, all institutions of higher education should be required by the federal government, which funds them, to conduct the same government-developed climate survey at the same interval and that, uh, you know, every two years or whatever, and that data should be publicly reported by school. There's no excuse for the fact that this has not already occurred because we know it's an important intervention. These institutions receive gazillions of public dollars um, and they should have to report out how they're doing with those gazillions of dollars, um, our dollars, taxpayer dollars. And um, 
They should also have to report publicly on aggregate data about their how their Title IX offices are performing, how many complaints, how many hearings, what are the results, what are the sanctions proposed, how many students are expelled, how many students are suspended, and so forth. Um, in terms of accountability, um, first, I think that dangerous offenders like stalkers, domestic abusers, and rapists who are found responsible in a fair process should be removed from campus, period, the end along with faculty who sexually harass students, you know, period. Like full stop, goodbye. Call your mother, get your toothbrush, go, go, try again somewhere else after you've learned your lesson. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think accountability is important to set community standards, protect other members of the community and as an educational intervention, because it's gonna be highly educational both for that individual who was told, I'm sorry, but you violated community standards, can't be here anymore. Um, and also for others who see that occur. Um, second, I think institutions themselves have to be held accountable in a real and serious manner. And I think the best way to achieve that accountability is through the transparency measures that I already mentioned, but also by strengthening the Office for Civil Rights with a massive increase in funding so that it can carry out its mandate and actually conduct investigations and impose serious sanctions in a timely manner. Um, in terms of, so that's the second, is uh, accountability. And then the third is um, in terms of prevention, I think that the most important reform is the adoption of universal evidence-based empowerment uh, training for vulnerable students. Um, and by vulnerable, I mean uh, woman identifying, uh, trans, non-binary uh, students. Most prevention training um, in use has little or no empirical evidence to support it. Sometimes it's just clearly box checking and symbolic compliance by institutions, um, by universities that are intended to prevent liability. Um, and some of it is probably harmful, but uh, very little of it has any evidence basis whatsoever. Um, there's one exception to that, and that is um, created by uh, Professor Sen, who I mentioned earlier, um, and it's a program known as EAAA, um, or sometimes colloquially called Flip the Script, and it's um, designed by Professor Sen and has been repeatedly shown in randomized controlled trials, which is the gold standard for research, um, uh, published in top-tier journals like the New England Journal of Medicine, um, to reduce completed rape by 50% and attempted rape by more than 60% on college campuses. Um, and when you consider the horrific personal, educational, medical, financial impacts of rape, this is just an incredibly effective, uh, both cost-effective and interpersonally effective uh, program. And the uh, female students who've completed this program at schools where it's been, including Stanford, where they've done very, very limited, you know, like 20 or 30 students trained, they say it was like a transformative experience and changed their life. Um, and it's openly, you know, feminist and empower empowerment training. Um, and, uh, you know, the fact that it hasn't been adopted widely is really a travesty. Um, and it's really a measure of how little colleges actually care about their female and trans students. Well, on that sobering note, let's jump into uh, some of these questions, some of which dovetail quite nicely with what you just mentioned. Um, Anonymous asks, what research do you wish existed about rape and sexual violence? Obviously, you want more outcomes and impact research from the various interventions. What else? What other research would you wish exist? Do you wish existed? You know, one of the things about this that's so interesting is that there is so much research. You know, this is a very, very uh, uh, understood um, phenomenon, at least when we're talking about campuses, but also in general. Um, there is a, a lot of research, um, and what we need is more action. We need the connection between research and practice to be made. And I think what's difficult is that um, that involves hard decisions by uh, um, uh, administrators, I'm just going to speak about the educational context for a minute because I think it's a great example. We know that fraternities are a problem. There's reams of research uh, conducted by both, you know, the, uh, the government and by um, independent scholars. We know that fraternities raise the rate and the risk of sexual violence um, 
astronomically. There's one federal study that shows that if a female student attends one fraternity party a month, their odds of experiencing sexual violence go up 38% from attending that one party. So why do fraternities still exist, right? It's not like we're sitting around waiting for more research. Oh, you know, <laughs> numbers just aren't in. The numbers are in. The data is here. And the action that has to be taken is to eliminate fraternities. Fraternities are dangerous. They are criminal hotspots on every campus. And everyone knows that. There's no lack of research. What there is is a lack of action and a lack of accountability. Along those same lines, uh, Anonymous is asking, have you seen universities make symbolic but empty changes that dishonestly send a message to alumni and parents that they're taking care about campus rape? And I'll, I'll add to that, um, is this common? I think that's the standard strategy is, uh, and there's this great uh, sort of montage, I think it was in um, the film uh, Hunting Ground by, um, Amy Zeering and Kirby Dick. And uh, it's like that we take sexual violence very seriously. And it's sort of over and over and over again. You know, you see like the sort of montage of schools, you know, we take sexual violence very seriously. Um, so there's a lot of talk and not a lot of action. And this is sort of gets to my sort of key point that I made a minute ago, which is uh, talk is fine. Action is a problem. Accountability is almost never present. And so we need accountability from top to bottom. And um, that's, you know, that's what we're not seeing. We're not seeing schools being held accountable. They are uh, happy to make empty gestures. And I think, yes, some of these empty gestures increase the danger because they create a false sense of security on the part of students. And remember, students are 18, 19 years old. Like most of the rape that occurs is freshman uh, females. That's just numerically most of the rape that occurs in the first quarter or first semester of freshman year. And then sophomores um, also have high rates, but not as high and so forth. So um, you're talking about very young people. And if their school tells them, don't worry, you're safe here. I mean, Stanford is a great example of this because we have a whole, you know, we're a fully residential school. Everyone lives on campus all four years. And um, they have a whole ideology of, you know, this is your family, you're safe here. Like when you show up for first day, it says, welcome home on a big banner. Um, you know, they are really marketing that idea that Stanford is uh, extremely safe. And I'm sure other schools do this too, but not to the same extent. Like this is really a Stanford thing, the mythos of safety. And um, of course that is lulling those exact people into the sense that everyone here is your family. <laughs> Depending on how safe you were in your family, you may or may not feel like that's good. But for the majority of students that feels like, oh, you know, there are messages that I can trust people here and you can't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the statistics or, show you can't. 43% of female undergraduate students at Stanford experience sexual violence. That's Stanford's own data. And that's every institution to a greater or lesser extent. I know Bucknell, um, you know, the, the rate is one in three. Uh, it's just right. the rates are appallingly high. Um, do you, so Anonymous is asking, do you feel like the Title IX reforms at Stanford were net positive or did they make it harder to make meaningful change? I'm not sure if they're talking about the reforms that I was involved in in 2013 or the um, later reforms. Um, I think what's making it hard to make progress at Stanford is, uh, you know, the lack of will on the part of the administration. Certainly some members of the administration over time, over this period I'm talking about, were, you know, they subscribed to some of these same rape myths that we've been talking about. Uh, around alcohol and, um, you know, victim blaming. Um, I think that um, any reform effort is going to bring backlash. Like I said, it would be naive not to think so. So always in social movements, you are looking to play a longer game. You know, it's always two steps forward, one step back. In the case of Stanford, there was an extreme backlash, so extreme, in fact, that we were one of the few schools that actually our Title IX policies in some ways improved with the Trump regulations that came in. Um, for example, uh, one of the backlash items that happened was that Stanford um, defined sexual assault to be um, only penetration or oral copulation through force. 
um, or while the victim was completely unconscious, like that is not just intoxicated, but completely unconscious. And everything else was characterized as misconduct. Um, so it didn't matter if the victim was crying and pleading for the perpetrator to stop, that was misconduct. Um, so, you know, the definition of sexual assault prior to that had been sex, sex without consent. And as I said, there are some issues with consent that, you know, we could get into talking about, but that was a pretty good definition. And it became, and that's the FBI's definition, by the way. And then our definition, which was rewritten by one of my colleagues who is a criminal defense person who I mentioned earlier, you know, was sort of opposed to the recall and quite, you know, opposed to some of these reforms, rewrote it to be, you know, such much more like the criminal standard um, rather than, uh, you know, in for certain acts, um, you know, and it, it really had a very negative effect. On what you're laying out is using, so institutions using a lot of different mechanisms to not actually change, right? Whether it's definitions or uh, poor trainings or, or no training at all or ineffective trainings to uh, not then taking claims of rape and sexual violence, other forms of sexual violence seriously. Um, and even when they do take them, let's say seriously, they're not expelling people or they're not making the penalty very high. It's the same thing as you're discussing in the legal profession, in law enforcement, in Hollywood and entertainment. Um, can you speak about what it is about these institutions that is driving this? And maybe it, is it the core of what you're talking about, which is men's power? Yes. I mean, that's just like, yes, yeah. it's about, it's about, um, it's about the power of perpetrators and the way perpetrators are valued in the institution. Not all perpetrators are male identified and many, many although most are, and many victims are male, but we just need only to look at the Catholic Church to see that institutions will protect perpetrators, um, even institutions that are by their very nature sworn to protect the powerless, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's why, as I said at the very beginning, you know, the root cause of this is power disparity and inequality. And, and that is also, of course, the result of it. So, so to answer that question sort of directly about, you know, did the reforms make it worse? No, I don't think so. I think, you know, the thing is that we have to always be playing the long game and always be trying to move the ball forward. Because this is a deep seated, it's not going to go away anytime soon. And most of the time we don't even properly identify it. So we deal with the symptoms over here. Um, Anonymous asked, do you have any insights into how activists and allies can combat the funded slander campaigns that accompany prominent cases and take over social media? It was astounding to watch it in action with Amber Heard's case. And I'll just add to this, that this is a, these are well-funded PR campaigns that are associated and affiliated with defense attorneys. We saw it in the Cosby trial. I saw it firsthand. We saw it in the Weinstein trial. We saw it in the Danny Masterson trial. Uh, we saw it very effectively take place in Amber Heard's trial. Just wait for it. It's going to happen, um, you know, with Marilyn Manson's trial. Any of these prominent, um, you know, uh, alleged rapists who are going to be coming forward, watch it, watch it unfold. So, uh, Professor Dauber, what can we do? Yeah, I do think that the, you know, the the social media stuff that I saw around Amber's case um, really uh, was shocking to me. And um, I do think that these are funded, intentional um, actions that are being taken in order to discredit uh, victims and protect powerful perpetrators. Um, in terms of what we can do, um, <laughs> you know, I think that um, it's all, I mean, I think back to the O.J. Simpson case, there was no real social media, but, you know, the same sort of media circus and hideous victim blaming, you know, happened in that case. Um, and you're in Los Angeles, so I'm sure you were there at the, you know, time. And so it isn't just that it's social media, it's that that's a tool in the hands of, you know, powerful people to try to undermine the claims of victims. It's just one more tool. Um, and I do think that we need to be vigilant against the mobilization 
um, on social media. I was part of many different groups that were working against that mobilization. I've never experienced backlash, by the way, um, the way I did in the herd case. So I don't mean to minimize uh, this um, this new phenomenon, a relatively new phenomenon of social media um, and YouTube in particular. I think we need to go after. Um, I mean, Twitter is basically, you know, like. Elon Musk is beyond reaching, but I think YouTube, you know, Google played a really negative role. Um, and full disclosure, my husband works for Google, but Google itself and YouTube in particular played a really, really negative role in amplifying and monetizing the attacks on Amber and on these other survivors that you mentioned. So that's one thing I think we can start to hold big, powerful companies that want to have this reputation as, you know, do no evil, um, you know, they're doing evil in some of these instances, and we need to come after social media. So that's part of it. And the other part is that I just want to say the most discouraging thing to me as a feminist was seeing the role that women played, like in um, uh, Time's Up, uh, in the... Uh, horrible um, defenses of Cuomo and to some extent Weinstein and the sort of two-faced roles that some of these women lawyers, and I want to point out that they were lawyers, played uh, in some of these instances. You know, people that portrayed themselves as allies, but were behind the scenes working to defend and um, help, like Lisa Bloom, perpetrators. Um, that is enormously discouraging to me. Um, and uh, I think that we have to be willing to call out other women, um, particularly in the legal profession, for, you know, like these these things that they are doing, like, um, you know, often these lawyers that will represent these um, accused rapists, um, uh, like Weinstein, you know, they get women to do that. They get a, a skirt to, you know, a, a woman to use as a front. Um, and of course, they're lawyers and they have every right to take whatever work they want. But um, but the fact that they want to take that work does not, of course, they can, but that doesn't, you know, relieve them of being criticized for doing it. And it has been very discouraging to me to see um, some of the women in the legal profession who have been willing to victim blame other women and even pretend to be doing one thing while doing another. And Jean Bonvain in so many cases is yeah. a woman yes. who she excels. All yes. the rapists are hiring, uh, and watching her in the courtroom go after survivors using rape myths is really disheartening. It's really disheartening. And of course, she has the right to do that. She can build her her book of business any way she wants, but that doesn't mean she should be free of criticism for having made that choice. Absolutely. Um, and someone had asked about that percentage. You said 43%. 43% at Stanford. Sometimes they say 40. The actual number was uh, 43, but you know, 40 is bad enough, you know, nearly half. We have five. That does not include, by the way, that's just sexual assault and um, other forms of sexual violence. That doesn't include sexual harassment, which is a different and overlapping much higher number. That's that's an astonishing, I mean, that's that's making it normal, right? It's a normal part of that community. Um, and many college campuses and many institutions, tech companies and, you know, entertainment, Hollywood, the Catholic Church. Um, so uh, Anonymous asked, do you know where Brock Turner is now and what he's doing and also what Chanel Miller is doing? So Mr. Turner, I do not know where he is or what he's doing. Um, I was interested in holding uh, Aaron Persky accountable. I was not, you know, Brock Turner you know, received what he received from the legal system. And I think that, you know, the real accountability there needed to be against um, former Judge Persky. Um, in terms of uh, what Chanel is doing, Chanel uh, published a multiple prize winning book called Know My Name. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Um, telling her own story and bringing forward her own identity. Um, and uh, now is uh, continuing to write, and I'm sure we'll have other, um, you know, wonderful things for us to read in the future. She's an incredibly talented writer. She was an incredibly talented writer uh, prior to being assaulted by Mr. Turner, 
Um, and that is why her victim impact statement was so incredibly moving and powerful. One of the most um, heinous, and this isn't going to sound heinous, okay, but one of the most heinous things, in my opinion, that Judge Persky's campaign did is they claimed with no evidence whatsoever and falsely that she did not write her own victim impact statement. They claimed that, you know, variously uh, that I wrote it, that uh, a Ba a professional battered woman's advocate wrote it. I mean, they had all kinds of weird conspiracy theories. And uh, one of my colleagues said publicly, and this was really shameful, um, a woman, Barbara Babcock, who, you know, people regarded as a feminist. And she said, oh, it was just too sophisticated a statement for someone uh, so young to have written. I mean, it was just really shocking. And I thought, um, and, and she knew nothing. You know, she had no basis on which to say that. She just knew nothing. And, um, you know, I think that um, that was a way of silencing her and of taking away her voice. And I found that to be one of the most wretched, most revolting, most, you know, just enraging things that happened during the many, many enraging and revolting things that happened during that campaign. Because, um, you know, her she wrote that victim impact statement to recapture her voice and her agency. And then they tried to take it away from her by saying she couldn't possibly have written it. So I'm thrilled to say that she's continued to write. Wonderful to hear. And yeah, I couldn't agree with you more about taking her voice. Uh, we have two minutes for a very complicated question. Last one, do you support alternatives to criminal justice? Uh, for example, the use of restorative justice practices with sexual violence? Um, I think that that is a very important area to study. And I would like to see empirical evidence about the, um, the value, the success, and the, and the satisfaction of victims who utilize those processes, you know, over a longitudinal period. Um, I think that, you know, if they work and if victims find them to be um, improvements over tra more traditional uh, processes, then I would be all for that. But I would want to see empirical evidence. And I also don't want to say that um, I don't want to see anyone pressured into doing it. And I'll just say this, that one thing about, um, well, I have many thoughts about this and I know I, we're running out of time, but um, traditional gender roles uh, suggest that women should be ready to accept apologies. And that's one factor that makes me wanna see research. Another factor is that schools um, are bad at, handling this issue. They're bad at handling sexual violence. Generally, they can't even run a grievance process that they've been required to run since, you know, uh, since 1972 or whatever, you know, like they just can't do it because of all the power factors that I already talked about. So I'm deeply suspicious. You know, my understanding is restorative justice done correctly is expensive complicated and requires highly trained people. Um, and so a very well-resourced school like Stanford or Harvard or Yale might very well be able to do that um, given time and research. Uh, I question though, whether you know every school would have the resources to really do restorative justice correctly. So I would need to see research showing that that can happen um, and that victims over the long haul don't feel regret over participating in it. Um, but then, yes, I would be in favor. Thank you for this enlivening and, and informative conversation. Professor Dauber, it's just really been a pleasure and an honor learning from you and listening to uh, your kind of personal challenges and, and your advocacy and how that's affected you and how you've moved kind of, I'm not gonna say fearlessly, I'm sure there was plenty of fear, but with courage um, as, as you have at many points in time, to shift systems of power. It's just, you know, I really wanna, wanna honor that. We see you and we're so grateful for your work, both scholars and activists. Thank you so much for having me. This was a great conversation, Dr. Hilton. I feel like I've been talking to a genius on this subject, folks. I'm sure you feel the same. And I hope everyone shares this with friends and family and folks who need to hear this interview. Thank you all and have a wonderful rest of your day.